So by the time it came to the point of actually listing, it was just like, okay, this is our next step now. Mm -hmm. We've tried everything else. This is all that's left to do. Let's just do it. Welcome to The Princess of Possible, where you will hear some inspiring stories of people that have defied the impossible. My name is Emma Money, Cystic Fibrosis Warrior, 2020 Australian of the Year, South Australian local hero, or as I prefer, the Princess of Possible. Well, today's episode of The Princess of Possible, I am joined by the beautiful Jackie Fraser, a fellow sister. So Jackie, I find you absolutely amazing and inspirational on so many levels. You are so authentically, unapologetically yourself, and I admire that so much in your strength and courage and determination when it comes to beating CF and living life to its absolute fullest, and you are a great example of that. So thank you for being on today's show with me. I'm thank excited you. Thank to- Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. Now, I wanted to touch on a couple of things with you today because you came across on social media for me a few years ago, and social media is so big nowadays. And I think having CF and anybody can sort of appreciate this, that we all seem to have connections online with people these days, whoever you are, wherever you are. So for me, you came across a few years ago and what had happened for me to find you is you were really unwell. And now I'm going to say my my version and then I want you to tell me the actual true version. My version yeah. of, of seeing you and your story was that you fell quite ill and needed to have a lung transplant. And what you did was basically said no at that point. And then your beautiful husband, Aiden basically took some time off or quit his job. Again, you can correct me in all of this and decided to travel and sort of not do, I guess, what the doctors wanted you to do until you got to a point where that next stage happened. So take me back on that journey and tell me what actually happened. I guess I started getting more and more unwell in uh, 2018. I was having more um, IV antibiotics than I would normally have. Um, and just having to stay in hospital a bit more than usual. And then we had sort of made plans that after our wedding at the end of 2018, we would take off on a bit of a trip around Australia. We, yeah, made those sort of plans. And then just before our wedding, in we got married in November and the end of September, start of October, I got uh, influenza bird flu of all the strains to get Mm -hmm. um and I was really really sick I was yeah I was in hospital for three weeks and it was the most sick I've ever been in my life when you say I was on oxygen the whole time yeah I was gonna say can you like you were on oxygen I remember a lot of your photos for me you had your little oxygen friend tank all the time constantly with you how long did you have oxygen for so once I went on to oxygen full time I was um, using oxygen uh, a year for 18 months wow. before my transplant. Yeah, and that was, yeah, 24-7 oxygen. But when I was in hospital for this stint, I was just sort of there on oxygen for, for the hospital stay. Yeah. And then I was sort of well enough to, we got married in Bali, so then we travelled to Bali once I was out, got married, came back. And when we came back, I was even more unwell than when we had left. So that was another thing. Just I did more IVs, went back to work uh, and just sort of planned to work out, like keep working for the next couple of months until we left on our trip because we had all that planned and, you know, it got to February the following year after our wedding and after the flu. And we thought, oh, I'll just do, you know, a couple of weeks in hospital, have a tune-up, get, you know, my health as best as possible. Um, we sold everything in our house. We put some tenants in to rent it out. We packed up the car and our dog and we went to Perth and Aiden sort of dropped me at the hospital and I went in to have my, you know, couple of weeks of IVs, just a normal standard thing that, you know, people CF do quite often. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the hospital, I was went straight on to oxygen. Um, they couldn't believe the numbers of my oxygen saturation. So... 
I went straight onto oxygen literally as soon as I walked in the room and they did my first set of OBS. I was mm. straight on oxygen and I didn't come off until I had my transplant. So when, when you guys, you, uh, when was that? Sorry, I just spoke over you. <laughs> That was um, February 2019. Okay. I had my transplant in um, November 2020. Okay. So that's a fair while to be on the list for a transplant in a roundabout way. Is that, would you say that's correct? Yeah. So they had the conversation with us and said, you need a transplant pretty much right now. Um, We want to put you on the list. They brought over the team um, from the transplant hospital from Fiona Stanley um, and spoke to me about transplant and what that would look like. Um, and that they were happy to list me right then and there over that three weeks while I was in hospital having my tune up. Mm-hmm. I had all the work up done for transplant, which is a heat, like a lot of tests. They have to check your whole body to make sure that your the rest of your body's ready for transplant and that you you will cope. And we had a lot of discussions with a lot of doctors and my CF team and the transplant team and our parents. And we decided not to have the transplant, not to go on the list and to continue on and do our trip anyway Mm -hmm. with oxygen and with overnight ventilation as well. Wow. (laughs) Now, let me just clarify so people listening can appreciate what kind of trip you actually went on. You weren't flying around different states, countries in, you know, luxury hotels. What were you doing? <laughs> no, we were camping. <laughs> we were in a uh, camper trailer mm-hmm. um, and we spent eight months travelling up the WA coast and then back again home, um, yeah, living out of our camper trailer with oxygen, using like solar to power and charge everything. And it was crazy. Aiden's got PTSD from beeping <laughs> when my oxygen machine would be like low on battery and he'd have the solar panel and be running around trying to chase the sun and make sure that there was enough solar to power the charger. And Wow. Yeah. Were you not scared? Like you've literally basically been given the ultimatum in around that way and just kind of said no and decided to do your own thing. Was there ever a point in that few weeks that you thought what happens if what happens if you're out in the middle of wherever and, you know, there'd be so, I'd be petrified. There'd be so much fear around, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, let alone eight months. How did you emotionally and mentally for you swallow that and take that? And I guess you've talked about Aiden, your husband, and he, I have said this to you before, but Aiden and you are the ultimate love story in the way that he just, you can see the support that he gives you. And it's, it's so beautiful and chasing the sun around to get solar power throughout the (laughs) night for you. That's, that's a pretty romantic gesture, I would imagine. But how did you guys, how did you even prepare yourself mentally? Because that's a really scary thought. Every day of the trip, we would have a moment where we would look at each other and be like, are we doing the right thing? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Every day we wondered whether we're doing the right thing, but we tried to do it as, as safe as possible. We so we left uh, uh, end of Feb, start of March, mm-hmm. and then we had a wedding that we were coming back to. So we flew back for that in July. And while I was back for that two weeks, we did IV antibiotics again mm-hmm. so that I was still staying in the best health possible. We did telehealth at m- most of the main towns that we stopped at. So mm-hmm. we still spoke to the doctors, did lung function, bloods, all of that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were still staying like really close contact with them. Yeah, we, you know, I had backup scripts in case I needed antibiotics along the way. We worked out that, you know, worst case scenario, we would only go as far north as Broome, mm-hmm. and then it would take twenty four hours to drive home if we really needed to. Wow! <laughs> so we tried to be as safe as possible, um, and you know, we knew if, if I, you know, started to get a cough or anything changed, start the antibiotics straight away. Yeah. If they didn't help, then we would just drive home. Yeah, and do yeah. IVs. It's scary, isn't it? You talk about having a tune-up and I guess for people listening that maybe don't have CF, a tune-up, you know, I always like to say we're a little bit like a car. Every good car needs to go for a service and it's not because we're sick but we've just got to go in and have those IV antibiotics almost to just kill off any surface bugs and anything that might be lurking to avoid any potential infections. So very familiar with the tune-up, but it's really hard to actually mentally agree to do a tune-up when you live a pretty busy, oh, yeah. normal life and then CF interrupts you 
I mean, it interrupts you basically every day when it comes to what your treatment is, but it's a pretty hard yeah. <laughs> pill, so to speak, to swallow. Tell me, because um, my head is thinking a million things I want to ask you, but I've never had a lung transplant and I know that this for me was something that I wanted to know more about and I didn't want to hear just the surface stories and this is why I absolutely adore you because you're not afraid to talk about the experience and how it felt. So I wanted to touch on that side of it with you. So when you were, when, let's go on the sick level to start with because for me that's interesting, you know, Can you explain what it felt like when you were sick? Like, did you, you know how you were deteriorating? Like, explain that to me before we go down the next bit. Having oxygen is like a whole other thing as well, because I think as your lung function is declining, it's such a gradual thing. It's so slow over the years, you know, when you're, let's say I was, you know, 23 and at 60%. And then just gradually over the years, I got to, you know, it was 2018 and I was at about 40%. And and you don't notice that decrease each month or each year until it sort of hits you. Mm. And then you go from 40% um, and it was gradually declining that year. And then I got the flu, the bird flu, and it just really dropped. I think it dropped like 10 or 15% while in that couple of weeks while I was sick. And you feel that, you really feel that change. And then by the time I was on oxygen, I was, you know, around 16 to 20%. Mm -hmm. How did it affect you when it came to getting out of bed? Could you do that? Could you go to the shower? Because I would imagine you had no energy. Yeah, everything is really hard. Um, I couldn't stand in the shower. So I would go and have a shower and I would have to sit down. And a lot of the time I would have to call Aiden to help me get out of the shower because I was so both mentally and physically drained and exhausted. I spent a lot of time on the shower floor when I was sick, <laughs> like crying or, you know, trying to wash my hair or, you know, just trying to regain my energy to get back out of the shower. So there are a lot of times when I would be on the shower floor crying and Aiden would have to come in and help me get out and dry me and help me get dressed because you're just so exhausted Mm. physically and then add the mental side of that as well of what you're going through and you know are you going to get through the night are you going to make it another day that yeah it was it was very exhausting and then add just life into that you know I wasn't working but we were trying to run a business from at home Mm -hmm. so I was doing that um, and then, you know, you've got normal social events and you have to kind of put on a bit of a brave face and go out to an event and carry around your oxygen and have new people stare at you or ask you what's happening or what that is. And, you know, people ask the randomest things, you know, if someone came up to me once and said, oh, so what's the outcome going to be? And I was like, oh, well, really? probably death. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How do you respond to that as well? And it's like you probably you'd be quite taken back. <laughs> Very taken aback. And just, you know, people just ask the randomest things. I, I, I think they mean they're like curious and they want to ask more, but they just don't know how to ask an appropriate question. <laughs> yeah. And I guess in, I find too people when they don't understand something or it's not normal for them to see that, they can, there's ignorance that comes with that and that can be quite funny and I think you've got to sort of take it very lightly to a degree. So let's go down the path of the actual transplant. So when you had the decision, you came home, you knew that you were going to have to be listed. Take me through that and did you and Aiden get to a point where you, I mean, I would imagine sitting with my partner really thinking about what that was to look like and how you would manage what happened between you two as far as the conversations that people don't normally talk about you know what what did what happened yeah so i think by the time we got to actually going okay we need to list for transplant where we've exhausted everything else because we we gave track after a go as well Mm -hmm. um, and that didn't quite give me the results that we wanted so we knew we had exhausted everything that was available to us we had tried the you know being out in the sun and not working and the more alternative side of it I suppose Mm -hmm. that didn't work we came home we tried track after um that didn't work we knew that was you know the best possible drug to help and we got to the point, and this was September 2020, we got to the point and we knew that we just, we had to list. And I think going on the trip 
that we went on for eight months where we were just together every day on beautiful beaches with our dog, you know, living a really, despite everything that was going on, we were living a really wonderful life. I think that helped us deal with it. And we had a lot of conversations during that time. We spoke about what would happen when we decide to list, you know, what would happen if, if I didn't make it through the transplant, what all of that would look like to us. And, you know, obviously you go to like, I want you to be happy and move on. You know, we had all of those conversations while we were doing the, the travel. So by the time it came to the point of actually listing, it was just like, okay, this is our next step now. Mm -hmm. We've tried everything else. This is all that's left to do. Let's just do it. Yeah. And, you know, there is a point where you're listing for transplant where the final thing is you actually have to sign on a dotted line and that is the final point where you like, okay, you're officially listed and doing that was just one of the craziest things. Like knowing that as soon as you sign your name on this dotted line, you're now listed and waiting for a transplant and that was crazy to do. Yeah. I remember like doing that and then I think I went to donate blood or something and then I was just sitting in the car and I had to have a phone conversation with with the lady, um, one of the transplant nurses and we were talking about my blood type and, and all these different things and then when the transplant happens, you know, they'll, they'll need Aiden's contact number because if anything happens to me while I'm under anaesthetic, he'll be the one making all the decisions. And that part was really emotional for us and for him, him knowing that like he's my husband now, he's the one that's in charge and that they go to if something happens, if something goes wrong. Mm. And he got, yeah, we both got quite emotional about that because I guess that's a reminder that something can go wrong. Yeah. Um, and that often it, it does. Yeah, that's scary. And it's a it's very medical in the way of thinking, but that, it, that's what they have to do. And it's probably a lot for someone to take on. You know, our whole lives you've got your parents who have been the ones that have supported you and fought for you, but when it gets to that dotted line and, you, like you said, you're married, he's your husband, it's not your mum or dad anymore, as much as they probably would want some sort of say, but that's, you know, this is yeah. your person and he's going to make the right decision. That would have been tough. And I think that was a lot to take on like as yeah. you know someone uh we were 20 29 28 when that was all happening 29 I think and yeah that was I think a lot for him to take on as my husband and as a 29 year old suddenly being you know knowing that if something goes wrong and they need to make a decision about my life then he's in charge of that yeah that's a lot of responsibility so tell me, because it, it, I couldn't imagine, tell me when you, how long since the day they listed you to the day you got the call and where were you, what were you doing and, and what happened? So we were very, very lucky. We are so grateful. We only had a 52-day wait. Some people will wait. The average in Australia is four months. So we were lucky that it was only 52 days. My, my blood type is very average. Um, a good height so everything sort of worked in our favour that um, we shouldn't have to wait too long for a set of lungs. Um, so 52 days we were uh, in bed asleep. I'd actually been out that day with my friend, she was getting married and I was a bridesmaid so we were going and looking at um, like a wedding venue. We had a really nice day. We'd actually had a conversation about my funeral and what that might look like and how, like, how I wanted it to happen. And then just by chance that night, we we were in bed asleep and my phone rang and it was 11.59, I remember. And I knew as soon as I saw the number on the screen that like only one person is calling me at midnight in the middle of the night. Yeah. And I answered and it was the transplant nurse and she, you know, she said, you know, Jackie, we've got a set of lungs and... And they always ring two people. So they'll ring a, a priority person and then they ring a backup in case it doesn't work out for the priority person. So I asked, you know, was I priority? And she said, yes, you're the number one person. How long is it going to take you to get to Perth? And I said, you know, it would take us two and a half hours. So she said, okay, go back to sleep because we need you. We don't need you here till seven. So go back to sleep and we'll call again at 4.30 to confirm that it's 
you know, still going ahead because you don't know that it's going to go ahead until the very last minute. Like you're laying on the table and they're like, okay, great, let's go. Oh my God. So it could change at any time. So you go back to sleep and we'll call you again at 4.30. So I've like hung up the phone and I just turned to Aiden and I was like, uh, I don't think we need to do it. It's okay. Like, we'll just keep living like this for a little while. I was like fully freaked out. Absolutely. And he just was very calm. Just lay down. Let's just have a think about it. And then when they call back, then we'll proceed from there. So he went back to sleep very easily. I think he knew he wasn't going to be sleeping for the next 28, 24, 48 hours. Um, but I laid awake for quite a while. <laughs> I could, I would, what, yeah, what do you even think in that point? You just said you're laying on a table and there's and a I, high chance. Like, And that day you're speaking about having your own, what your funeral looks like. That's a pretty yeah. dark place to be in, I would imagine. Um, you're such a bright, bubbly person still with all of this going on your life is literally you know up up for I would say up for grabs but it's not up for grabs you're, you're in such a horrible situation but you're still wanting to just go on the way you were and just live life so I'm guessing yeah. um well we know how that story ended seven o'clock came <laughs> and you and Aiden obviously went to the hospital yeah, yeah. The, what was it like when and obviously when you get there, I would imagine it's madness and whatnot. But one thing that fascinates yeah. me big time is the process of when you go in to have an anaesthetic because as soon as you're under, you're under. Yeah. So let's skip a little bit and get to the point where you're having the anaesthetic. I mean, obviously on the way, and again, you tell me in your words, but, you know, I would assume you would call your family. Did you call your family? And, and then yeah. who was there with you and take yeah, me through that? Yeah, so- Yep, 4.30 came around and they called again. Um, and so we got up and they said, yep, it's still proceeding. So at that point we called family. So we'd already arranged with family. Like we would just call one of Aiden's parents and then call one of my parents and it would be their jobs to then let everyone else know. So to call my sisters, Aiden's brother, yeah. you know, close friends, that kind of thing. So we did that and then we, we already had like a bag packed for both of us with, you know, toiletries and things so we didn't have to worry about packing we just grabbed the bag they said I could have some breakfast because it would be a little while until the surgery so I had some chocolate cereal and a cup of tea <laughs> and we got in the car and we started driving to Perth and we we called our you know our closest friends and the phone calls were quite emotional so we just sort of did those very quickly we were trying not to I guess get absorbed in the emotion of it all because as soon as you let it take you it would just overcome us um so we were in we drove to Perth it was a two hour two and a half hour drive got to the hospital and it's all pretty much go go but by the time we got there within a couple of minutes like both our families were there um my sisters my brother Aiden's brother his wife like our niece and nephew so everyone was there in the room it was really lovely we were all just there together like laughing and chatting we had some photos yeah, it was it was really nice. Like I was really glad everybody was there with us. Yeah. Um, I got wheeled off a few times to do a couple of last X rays and some blood tests and things. Um, and then it was like uh, they came in and they said that it's time to go down. Like we're ready for you in theatre. And at that point, that was probably the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life because I knew I had to get wheeled off and I didn't know if I was going to see anyone again mm. or not. Mm. So those final cuddles with people were probably the hardest because I didn't know if they were going to be the last ones. So that part was really difficult. And I was very lucky. The whole thing, um, a, a lot of people were taking videos and stuff as well. So I've got so much footage and I've, I've like put it all together and made a video of it all, which is really mm -hmm. nice to have. And there's one moment that, is like I'm getting wheeled off and my dad, you know, has given me a cuddle and a kiss and and obviously going down to theatre, Aiden's coming with me because he's my husband now and there's a part where my dad is, he doesn't know where to go. Like he's kind of walking with the, the bed being wheeled and then he's kind of realising like, oh, I don't go that, I don't go any further I have to stay here now I have to let her go with Aiden mm. and it's such like a 
it's such like a beautiful little moment because you can see dad's kind of like hovering and then he's realizing I have to let her go with Aiden now. Mm. And that must be really hard. That must have been a really hard moment. Um, and then I get wheeled down and um, Aiden and I have some time together, which was really good. Um, we had a couple of photos and by this point I'm feeling ready. Mm -hmm. I'm now, you know, having that time alone with Aiden where we could just talk and hug and kiss and have some photos and be together just for that little bit of time really calmed us both down. I think if we didn't have that, it would have all been a bit too much, but um, yeah. we had that little bit of time together. And then as I was getting said goodbye to him um, and wheeled off, I felt ready and I felt empowered and I felt like it was going to be okay. And I remember just turning back and like waving to him and I just said, I'll see you soon. And they wheeled me into this, like ginormous theatre room and it was just all metal and sterile and cold and there were so many people in there just making things happen. As soon as I got in and like got up on the table, they were um, putting in cannulas and my epidural and attaching things to me and they had Mozart playing in the background. <laughs> Keep your relaxed. So it was very, <laughs> it was very calming. Mm -hmm. um, they had, you know, YouTube up and a bit of music and they're, they're all really lovely. They're all so good at what they do. Very professional. Um, one of the anesthesiists held my hand while I had the epidural put in, which was really lovely. And then you're just laying on this bed because they still don't know if the surgery is going to go ahead or not. So you're laying on this metal table with all these drips and things and they don't know yet if it's going to go ahead because they have to wait till they open up the donor and they view the lungs. They have to see the lungs before they can confirm that it's going ahead. So there was a point where I was just laying in this bed, Mozart was playing, all these like anesthesias and nurses and surgeons were lined up next to me just waiting for the go ahead. It was wild. It was like the wildest thing I've ever been through. That is. And then they say, okay, okay, it's going ahead. Um, and they put me to sleep. And I just remember thinking like, Jackie, you just have to wake up from this. And that was it. And then I woke up. <laughs> How long did the surgery take? I think it was about six to seven hours. So I've been told. So I went in at about 2 p.m. on a Sunday. So we'd driven up, got there 7 a.m. Sunday morning, went in at about 2 p.m. I think, or, or maybe Aiden got the call at 2 p.m. that said, okay, it's going ahead. You know, she's, she's knocked out. Yeah. And then it was about six to seven hours. So everyone that was, you know, was just sort of waiting around. They all went out for dinner, came back to the hospital, and then they got the call to say that it had all went well. Mm -hmm. They, I think it was about midnight on Sunday that my dad and Aiden were allowed to go and see me. So I'd been wheeled through into ICU or maybe the one before ICU yeah. after the surgery. And they said, you know, you can come in and see her now. What a and relief. I was out cold. They must have had so much relief coming in and just what a whirlwind of an experience. Yeah. To go Absolutely. out for dinner while you're yeah. being, put, yeah. you know, lungs in, in your body. I don't think, um, I don't know that they would have been that hungry <laughs> to be able no. to come in <laughs> and see you. That would have been a moment of probably, well, for both of them, they're the two important men in your life and to see that you've... Yeah you know, gone through it and you're, you were okay in the words of the doctor. Yeah. I would imagine. I think that was very special for them to share, to share that moment together. Yeah. It's a, not a moment that you would want anyone to have, but I guess if you're in that situation to be able to experience that and have that, um, yeah, it's very special. That's for sure. So that's yeah. quite the journey in itself. So let's you know go forward from a recovery you've you know when you've, you're awake and everything's happened what did the coming months look like for you as far as getting used to life what was that first breath like with these new lungs do you remember that that was yes that was very special um that's in my video I, my sister managed to capture that exact moment so 
you don't, it's not like you wake up from the transplant and you take your first breath straight away because you've got high flow oxygen to keep the lungs like full um, for a day or so. And then you're on normal oxygen just while everything's recovering. So I was still on oxygen for a couple of days. And then there was a moment when I was chatting away to my mum and my sister and the nurse said, Jackie, just so you know, your oxygen's been off for 15 minutes now. And I just remember bursting into tears because it, I had been on oxygen for 18 months. It had like ruled my life mm. for, for so long. I couldn't go anywhere without oxygen. I couldn't do anything without oxygen. So that moment of, of having like been sitting there and chatting, chatting, chatting away and not having lost my breath or, or been gasping for air mm. and, yeah, her saying that it was off. And we haven't gone back. <laughs> that, which was just yeah really special really special is, to watch that is now that video that you keep talking about is that something that we can pop up so that people can check it out and have a look or is it a personal video that you've got yeah yeah no so the link is um in my bio um in my instagram cool um well, we'll, i think it's just called like my transplant video or something <laughs> um, well i'll um i'll make sure that we share it so that people that are listening and watching can see what you went through because for me I must admit you know I don't think I had a dry eye watching it um and I think following on from that I mean you've now got this new life which we'll go into organ donation is that something that you advocate for now because of what you've gone through yes yeah yeah how if I wanted to be an organ donor how do I go about becoming an organ donor here in Australia tell me that yeah, so it's really easy to become an do- organ donor. You just jump online to the Donate Life website. Yep. You need your Medicare card and it takes less than a minute to register. And then the most important thing is that you speak to your family about your wishes because at the end of the day, the decision is, is up to them as well. That's very important. I don't think that enough people know that that's something that we can choose to do. And if not, they know now. So it's obviously how many years now, because I'm not good with my numbers at the best of times, 2019 transplant happened. How old are you? So 2020, November, when I had the transplant. Yeah. yeah. So we're about 14, 15 months in, I think. Wow. So still probably fresh, but not fresh enough, but but long enough yeah. to be able to have planned moving forward in life, um, which I'm excited to hear about because I know yeah. there's a few things that you are very passionate about and advocate for. One thing that you spoke about earlier was a business that you and Aiden had started and, and was running, which I love what you guys started. I'm not going to talk about it because it's your platform here today. I want you to tell me about what it yeah. is and how it came about and um, you know how can, how can we have a look at what you've got. Yeah, so we wanted to be able to give back to the CF community regularly. So we've done fundraisers and things in the past, but we wanted something that could give back like all the time, a money amount that we could give back, as well as awareness. So I can't take credit for the name. Aiden came up with Rose Lungs, um, obviously relates to the rose that represents cystic fibrosis, 65 roses, that story, Mm -hmm. and then lungs because that's predominantly what it affects. So, uh, and it's quite catchy, I think, where his lungs seem to have, you know, taken taken by storm a little bit. Um, So it's a clothing label. We do just the basics, something for everyone, T-shirts, hats, what else, stickers, mugs, um, coffee cups that kind of stuff, yep. um, you can visit our website at roselungs.com. Mm-hmm. And it seems to have really done well for raising awareness. We hear stories all the time of people wearing rose lungs and someone saying, oh, what's, what's rose lungs? And then they go into the spiel of CF and what it is and sometimes share my story. And, you know, 10% of profits of our profits goes to Conquer Cystic Fibrosis, which is a volunteer-run organisation here in WA. Mm -hmm. And they're very focused on research, which is what we're very passionate about, our money going to research. So that's amazing. that's sort of Rose Lung in a nutshell. (laughs) Yeah, well done. No, I think it's great. And it's nice to, like you said, you know, it raises awareness and you guys can work on that as a bit of a side side hustle, so to speak. But what I want to know now is what does life look like for you now like you look amazing and you've got such a good beautiful glow about you what does cf look like now because the transplant doesn't get rid of cf so 
in a moment talk me through there's obviously still demands of having CF, so to speak. And how does that affect you at the moment and, you know, moving forward is with what you guys wanting to do? Yeah, so the lungs are amazing. My lungs don't have CF anymore. Um, I have a beautiful, healthy, wonderful set of lungs. But the rest of my body still does have CF. So I still have the gut issues. I still take prion. I actually take more medication now than I took previous to having the transplant because um, you're on immune suppressants for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. um, to suppress the immune system so that the lungs, your body doesn't reject the lungs. Mm -hmm. So that's a a forever thing. That's always, always can be an issue that could pop up at any time. So that's something where, you know, really trying to hone in on. We have to be very careful still not to get sick because that could increase the immune system and reject the lungs. Yeah. You just really, yeah, swapping one set of medical problems for another. Yeah. But I can breathe and I can run and now I look forward to feeling out of breath because I know I'm going to get my breath back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a nice feeling like going up a really big set of stairs and feeling a bit puffed and, yeah, being able to do that without dying. Yeah. The yeah, simple things, I guess, <laughs> isn't it? Like the simple yeah, things that... Yeah, making the, um, the bed... Yeah, making the a shower bed. standing. <laughs> Have you laid down on the floor since? <laughs> In the shower? Yeah, not very often, not often. <laughs> I would imagine that so many people today take advantage of the little things in life and, you know, with what you've gone through, you're exactly making the impossible possible. You you know, you're a fellow princess of possible, really, Um, in hearing that you have got such strength and determination and mentally you are so right in what you said earlier when you almost had to pep talk yourself to be like, Jackie, I've got to wake up. Like you just knew what you had to do and if you let your mind and body go through those negative um, feelings and process things and go down that path, then it will take over. And you are such an incredible example of how not to let that happen. And you've obviously still felt and gone through those really dark, horrible times, but you've got what sounds to be the most amazing support network. So through talking about it, you've been able to really work on remaining positive, but still acknowledging what's going on I think that's really really commendable to you so well done I think that's inspiring so tell me now because I actually haven't told everyone how old you are which they might have figured it out back now oh yeah I'm 30 so I turned 30 in October last year which um for someone with CF is such a big milestone it's so special to be able to turn 30 and you know yeah. make it this far which is I'm so grateful for I'm grateful to my organ donor every single day mm. and their family for for giving me this gift and, and making sure that I can keep living which is just yeah it's the first life. year after transplant is pretty wild but after after the 12 month mark things got a lot better and now we're just so lucky to be able to just live a relatively normal life and what does that look like? What do you do, what do you do now? And you know, do you have a job? Are you working? Because you're sort of. I always hate to say you're normal because no one's normal. <laughs> what does normal look like for you? And and what what goals have you got coming up? So we've actually thrown our jobs in. <laughs> so we've quit our jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, I think going through everything that we did, and everyone should know how short life life can really be. So it's nice to just realize that we're, we were unhappy doing what we were doing and life's too short to be unhappy and just going through the motions. So we threw our jobs in and we've decided to go traveling again and finish the trip that we didn't get to finish last time. Mm-hmm. So we left a couple of weeks ago our home in Bustleton and we've been traveling around in our um, camper with our dogs and just living our best life really well yeah we've got plans to keep doing it for the next um next two or three years mm -hmm. and hopefully pending covid go interstate maybe next year when it's a little bit safer Mm -hmm. yeah so just sort of move around probably work a little bit along the way at like a cafe or or a bar or you know whatever very hippie vibes i think if anyone after today listens to this whoever's listening i should say looks on your Instagram, you're quite out there as well. You're not afraid. I mean, I saw a picture of your um, your peach in the ocean the other, the other day that you popped yep. up. You're not afraid to be out there and sort of voice your opinion. I often also say you're quite 
a feminist as well. You've got some in a yep. good way. You're really mm -hmm. strong with your opinions and views, but accepting for what other people are also feeling and saying. So I love that energy in you. And you just have this really big carefree thing or attitude, not thing. You've got a really carefree attitude about life. <laughs> so tell me with your with the way you, you view everything in that sense from a women's empowerment, that's that's huge. What sort of got you going on that that rant? I'd say rant because every time you pop something up, I love it because it's very out there and I think, oh, my gosh, you've posted something that is very confronting but an issue that we don't talk about. So you've sort of... The vulva. Yeah, you've, you're the vulva and, you know, pubic hair and everything. But it's, yeah, it's yeah. you're not afraid to um, be out there and I guess part of that would come from what you've gone through. Life's too short, so fuck it. Yeah. Just put me out there. Yeah. Tell me, like, yeah. where does this passion come from and why, why and have you got anything in the works maybe in the near future to continue down that path? I think that the feminism part of me has just come from, you know, seeing so much in the media that's so anti, I don't want to say anti-women, but it puts so much pressure on us to look a certain way and act a certain way and you know, have big boobs and this and that and be wrinkle free and hairless, you know, not have a single hair in our body. And I just think that if, and I'm okay with women living like that as well, but I think that we should do it because we want to, you know, if you want to shave your legs, then you should shave your legs. You shouldn't feel like yeah. you have to shave your underarms because society says so. Yeah. I just think, you know, there's so much pressure on us to look a certain way and act a certain way that it's just we need to get rid of that pressure yeah. and just do things that we authentically want to do. You yeah. Know? I haven't shaved my underarm for the entirety of our trip. And I, I, I'm I, happy with that and I feel okay with that and I don't think anyone should judge me because I am choosing to grow my underarm hair. No, <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. It's, it's funny you say that because... You know, I um on the flip side, I openly have spoken about my own body. Body issue is huge. Now, with cystic fibrosis for me, my stomach is just completely covered in scars um, and I'm so self-conscious of it. And when you're in a position to be able to um, talk about, you know, self-love and whatnot, it is so important, but you've hit the nail on the head. It should be a choice for you to do it or not. So for me... I had an infuser port, which is the lump in the side of your chest, and it looked like a third boob for a very long time. Um, and then yeah, yeah. I finally have got to a point where I got well enough to be able to remove it. But I had breastfed two kids, had this lump hanging out, and absolutely so conscious of my body that I went and got breast implants. And that was a decision that I made because it made me feel better. It wasn't about anyone else. I was sick, sick of looking like yeah. that sick girl. So I am very proud about that and have to probably cover up sometimes a little bit more than I do, wear a bra <laughs> occasionally. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It's girl power in a way of going, you know what, you actually don't know why I'm making this decision for my body. And I think that is a message absolutely that we should be able to be who we are and not be judged for it. And the only way that that's going to continue is by having people like yourself, um, you know, stand up for this is who I am and I'm not apologising and this is this is me. Yeah. So I credit you in that yeah. as well. I think that's so important and, and such a good message for young girls, especially today, because, this, I mean, even at the moment, I'm also guilty for this. I'm probably the we're very opposite in our in our ways in around that way. Um, you know, I'll put a, a Instagram story up and love a good filter. My mum is the first to get mad at me and reply to it. Your lips look ridiculous. It's the filter, but your stuff it's completely <laughs> beautiful. It's you. You don't have all the emphasis of of a filter. So. I love that and I, I love try not to use filters. <laughs> no, I don't. Only, you know, and that's just my choice as well. But yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, if you like a filter, then great, use one. If you don't want to use one, don't use one. It shouldn't be, we shouldn't feel like we have to hide ourselves on Instagram or, you know, if you're not having a great day, you shouldn't feel like you have to pop a filter on. But if you choose to, that's okay as well. It's just, you know, we should all just be trying to live as best in our authentic selves as, and, society should support that yeah i think that is that's a perfect way to probably wrap wrap our chat up today because mm -hmm. we've covered i could talk to you for hours and ages about all sorts of things but i am so grateful to speaking with speaking with you today 
next time I might have to get Aiden on the show. I feel like, you know, yeah. the impossible, which I said to you earlier, the show is about making the impossible possible. And without having his support, I feel like you probably wouldn't have had those things come true. And what a credit to no, him, absolutely. you know. I couldn't imagine what yeah. it's like for him to be, well, anyone who is a partner to someone with a disability or illness, it, it's, it's a lot for someone. So we might have to have yeah. a chat with Aiden. But I honestly thank you from the bottom of my heart. I think you're so inspiring and I love the messages that you put out there. So keep doing what you're doing. And everyone that's listening today, yeah, will check out Rose Lungs. So Jackie, thank you so much for your time. And I just wanted to say, I wish you all the best with your safe travels or with your travels, stay safe. And I look forward to seeing what, what mischief you and Aiden get up to in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening today. For more information on upcoming episodes, or you just want to check out what I'm up to, head over to my Instagram, CFMummy. Now I put it to you to go and make the impossible possible.